Welcome to the And Now for Something Completely Mission and Podcast. I'm joined today by a very special guest. This is John Gator, also known probably uh, many years ago now as Dalt Wisney. Um, welcome to the show, John. Uh, thanks for having me. Welcome. Um, for those of you that haven't heard about John, um, he's probably most well known for creating that infamous bullet time shot we hear so much about in the Matrix films. I think especially um, evident in the Resurrections uh, film, for those of you that haven't really seen that either. Uh, and of course, uh, he's also known for developing other things such as volumetric cinematography and universal capture. Uh, his resume is amazing, notably, and of course, he won the Best Visual Effects Oscar at the 72nd Academy Awards for his work on The Matrix. And since then, he co-founded Lucasfilm's immersive entertainment division called ILMX Lab, um, which has been uh, a pioneer in virtual reality, mixed reality, holographic cinema and future theme parks. And he acts as its executive creative director, I think, working on um, the portfolio of premium experiences, which include Star Wars. Um, and most recently, he did, he did a, a cameo in front of the camera in Matrix Resurrections. Um, and you can check out his film credits on the Internet Movie Database, which we'll provide a link to in the show notes. Now, um, from our perspective on the podcast, John has also had a long time interest in machinima. At least that's according to Kim Libreri, who, um, as you're probably aware, is the chief technology officer at Epic Games, um, whom I interviewed for the Pioneers in Machinima book um, that Penn and I published last year. So, John, when did you first hear about machinima and what do you recall of your first thoughts about it? Well, um, that's a good question. I would, I would suggest that it was around the time that we were making the trilogy, I guess, Matrix trilogy, uh, that those many years ago, late nineties or yeah, perhaps early 2000, early two thousands, um, you know, it gets fuzzy, uh, yeah, but absolutely. it was around that, it was around that time and yeah, it was um, a a sort of obviously a in a, a ha almost like a, a hacker's sort of disruption of the video game. Uh, I wouldn't call it the business. It would be like the sort of format of video games, and that was uh, obviously very interesting. Cool. So, um, I mean, one of the things that um, Kim mentioned when I talked to him was that your interest in it is what kind of led you to develop this demo for this, the Sony GSQ PlayStation supercomputer, which, as far as I am aware, was shown at SIGGRAPH in 2000, when um, you were asked to create something Matrix themed. Can you tell us anything more about what you created? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, then... It just it would be good to put a little context um, behind it, and I, I I would guess if you talk to Kim about it, you might know this context. But I'll 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 reiterate it for this podcast. Um, so when we were making uh, the Matrix trilogy, it was obviously uh, had resonance uh, well beyond just visual effects technique. It was it was much more um, uh, impactful with regard to the some of the concepts underlying, and in particular, there were um, aside from folks who were obviously uh, triggered in a way to think existentially about what is real. Uh, there were other people who were even at, at that time imagining. Uh, uh, a long road towards uh, creating uh, the capacity to run massive simulations, you know, massive, flawlessly real simulations that people could uh, live within, play within, tell stories within. And so those sorts of folks, there were many interesting folks that found us that had nothing to do with the film business uh, many people in different technologies and, and artists and writers, um, scientists, engineers, 
There was a person who was very significant, though, in the game industry uh, that found us, the inventor of the PlayStation, uh, Ken Kudaragi. And we wound up, the Wachowskis uh, and Kim and I, uh, wound up having uh, a number of good, long conversations over very nice meals uh, to talk about the future. And, you know, as you can imagine, he had a lot of thoughts about that. And in fact, you know, went on to describe in great detail, in a very prescient way, the 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 coming of the cloud, basically, the ability to serve, uh, uh, you know, um, unlimited uh, high bandwidth, exquisite content, <laughs> not from your machine, but from somewhere else. And so anyway, uh, this led to, you know, a good relationship. And he uh, let us in on this experiment where he was going to try to create this giant uh, PlayStation based parallel processing computer, you know, he was going to band, I think he was going to band together 16 playstations to you know provide the the compute to run a new kind of uh real-time simulation and that's kind of the beginning he's like we i would uh like you guys to get involved in, and think about something you might want to do uh with that capability and it is interesting you know to bring up that test relative to today because awakens i think i get why why you ask that because awakens <laughs> in a sense is a is a dot connect back to this this yeah. uh demonstration we did in 2000 and that demonstration was not a lot different it was essentially um a a, um, a sort of a premise of creating uh dramatic content that could be used, you know, at, in and of itself, you know, as a experience, but also could be used to help understand uh, how to stage story and cinematic scenes using game engines. Mm -hmm. It was both really. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, uh, the future idea at the time was that, well, in the future, uh, this will be uh, something that everybody does and people will be in world doing things like this uh, being involved with other characters and with each other. Those were the underlying themes. And we made it, um, you know, a sort of a, a fantasy matrix scene, you know, a Trinity being chased on the rooftops of a, of a major city. Uh, and, and oddly, you know, here we are, we, we're almost 20 years later mm -hmm. and never expected uh, Matrix to return because of the what we thought was conclusiveness of the trilogy. <laughs> yeah. And then we realized it was, we realized that our colleagues, you know, the Wachowskis wanted to tell another story. And so we, uh, Kim and I tried to understand, well, what would be our place in this new, <laughs> in this new thing, because it's so many years later and we're doing many different things and not often cinema directly, like work going out and doing shoots. So, mm -hmm. This is this is what we arrived at as the right the right way to participate in resurrecting the matrix. So it really is your deuce machina. <laughs> In a way, and um, it, it's it, it it's not as if we left. You know, we did that the matrix, and then we sort of all left for you know that many years. We we've always been in touch, and we've actually been doing. Uh, lots of different experiments and innovations along the way. And in Kim's case, he brought what I consider probably, you know, perhaps the most unique, you know, capability to graphics that anyone has. Uh, he brought that capability to um, and his experiences into, into Epic itself and has had a role, you know, working with Tim uh, Sweeney to transform Unreal into <laughs> into the uh, the very you know the very type of platform one would need to to really uh, manifest these things. Mm, absolutely, um, and you know, why an experience and not a game at this point with with the Matrix Awakens experience? I mean, twenty years later. 
Well, it's, it is a bit of all, it's a bit of everything uh, on purpose. It's a hybrid, the, which is what, um, you know, immersive worlds, metaverse like worlds are really going to be. They're going to have the capacity to, you know, to, to game in, of course, you could stage full games in these worlds. And a lot of uh, the experiences will be that because that's what, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. generation, young generations really want. They want interactive engagement and play. Uh, but the exact same destination uh, could be used to create, you know, spectacle and story and experiences of every kind. Uh, creator, you know, whole creator communities can, and all of that stuff, things we've learned from Second Life will be directly applicable, are already directly applicable. So there isn't, um, unless unless the, uh, the, the folks who sort of, uh, you know, how would I put it, launch specific destinations, unless they really want to have a very specific game focus of a particular game, uh, you know, there will be a lot of these environments that are going to be made by the users themselves. Mm, absolutely. And the thing that um, struck me about um, the experience is the fact that you've made it open so that anybody can actually, you know, to um, use the assets and create stories with it. It's, it's, you know, can you tell us a bit more about what your, your thought process is there? Oh, for sure. It's obviously, okay, so two things I would say about that. Firstly, you know, I've had several experiences and this was, this was like a new version of an old experience. And, the, and that would be, you know, building something really big and complicated like a studio at the same time that you're making some kind of entertainment product. I've been through like three versions of that where whole studios have been built or four versions, whole studios built, right? Um, while also making a movie, which is a big deal. Like you're making companies and organization structures. And so it's really complicated product plus build. Um, in this case, it's not exactly that, but it's similar in so far as, you know, Un Unreal 5 is really heading into its beta mode right now right like it's being uh used by the first developer ecosystem and along the way of making matrix awakens they were essentially dog fooding basically trying to figure out how to uh work with um you know new features and capabilities that were not possible before mm -hmm. uh particularly lumen and, and nanite uh and uh, and in the case of the way that the city was made, this uh, really extraordinary um, generative uh, uh, world building uh, tools uh, that are new, uh, the way that uh, a lot of the simulation content was put together, the, all the traffic and walking people, the deployment of metahumans. I mean, this is this was huge lift, mm. right? It was like bringing together these these different component pieces that have been in the making for years. And it's, you know, UE, UE5 is like a departure point. It's, it's always been considered to be a departure point, at least Tim Sweeney has always described it as, you know, the metaverse engine. Uh, so this is going on at the same time that we're making the experience. So the experience is to showcase UE5, but it's also to showcase, you know, what you could do with a cinematic metaverse like destination. So in the experience you see, yes, you could, um, you know, put a performance, storytelling performance by actual known people, actors and such, you know, like cinema, but volumetric. So there's volumetric cinema at the beginning. Uh, then uh, it transitions to actual gameplay, you know, seamlessly transitions into we're now in the story. We're actually having an interactive experience. It's fairly simple on purpose because, you know, it's it was such a big deal just to try to get something so complex to come together in like a year and a half. So 
you know, it's a simple sort of chase scene, shooter scene. But uh, they're, uh, you know, you know, all of these things are sort of taking place inside this, inside this simulation world. The last bit is actually probably the most interesting insofar as, you know, the end of the, the end of the demo is really the beginning of the sandbox of Matrix Awakens because mm. once you've gotten this little tease about, you know, types of things you can do there, basically the city is you know, yours, you, you can, you can now wander and drive and mingle around and people, it can be obviously so much more, uh, they, much more can go into this, uh, you know, whereby, you know, uh, sandbox experiences can start being put on top of this, you know, infinitely. Right. And, um, Absolutely, yeah. it's a pretty wonderful gift, uh, to, to give, to give developers and independence because this is very difficult to build, for even a, a talented company, it'd be really difficult to make this kind of, to get this starting point. So um, mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think it's a gift for machinima creators because to me, what you've got there is a is a thematic open world sim and thousands and thousands of playable assets, um, which, you know, it's, it's you know, I, I, saw a, I saw this great um, little machinima which tried to compare it to um, Grand Theft Auto. Um, which I think we reviewed that for our um, uh, February films thing. But what struck me about um, uh, the, the experience is the, the level of detail down to what you can see in the windows of the buildings to the vehicles and all a lot of it. It's just absolutely stunning detail. So it's a real, it's a real gift. Yes, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's a crossover moment, right? Because machinima, we've been using this term, it's in a sense is like, overtaking a machine that was made for one purpose and turning it towards storytelling. And, but, you know, we do this at the same time, you know, fully, you know, knowing that, you know, the real world where we can take cameras and shoot things and tell stories like that, that, that seemed like some like really like high plateau in terms of visual, let's say visual fidelity compared to where we began in machinima and we're like kind of like there we're like we're like there right we're like really one little beat and then you know machinima is cinema right it's we're we're about to have this crossover moment yeah and this is going to be amazing because it's going to unleash you know all all manner of new new types of storytelling absolutely We'll come on to that a little bit in a minute, but I just wanted to ask you one more question about this. What's the rationale for PlayStation 5 and, and Xbox S rather than the internet? And and I guess really one right. of the questions... Well, there... that, well, I was going to say, one of the questions that the audience might be interested in here is, when can we expect to see it on a PC? Okay, it's a great question. There's a reason for that, and that is it's a practical reason. Um, those systems are like bedrock benchmark understandable right there there there's no fluctuation from one users one user to the next so all users of ps5 will have exactly the same quality and uh you know um you know capability right. and you know with pcs uh even though we can do extraordinary things on PCs. Some, it's not democratized. Not everyone has the the most, you know, um, souped up system to get the the most output. You know, the 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 highest quality experience. So, in a really simple way, it was um, a starting point to stabilize. You know, to keep, create a stable, predictable outcome when for awakens. Um, but it also is to you know, uh, as well catalyze um, new, again, new forms of interactive entertainment on the game, on the game consoles. It, I can't say about when, because I'm not in Epic, right? So I can't say when they will do it, but obviously they all know that uh, extraordinary results can you know, can happen on PCs just that for this first effort, you know, you have to imagine like, okay, 
it's got to arrive on time. It's got to play reliably. It can't break. It's it's got to arrive on time because it was you know c- coming out within the season of Matrix Resurrections. So there really really couldn't there wasn't there couldn't be fail fail problems or people having a lesser experience that wasn't desirable, right? Uh, however, um, it's not you know it's not at all uh, unimaginable that they will. Uh, allow it to be on PC at some point because they do want people to sandbox and sandboxing can happen on all these all these platforms. Yeah, and probably the creators that we're talking about are most possibly most familiar with with PC based um, uh, tools and techniques and what have you rather than the, the, the PlayStation I would have thought. Um, but but yeah, completely understand where you're coming from on the quality of experience there. Yeah, I, I would say that's a good question to redirect. You know, we could both do this, but we'll redirect that back to Kim. I mean, you know, it's a simple question we could ask him. You know, like uh, when when this becomes truly available for everybody, will you you know enable a, a PC version? You know, they these uh, this company tends to use GDC as like a inflection point. They tend to like talk a lot then. Mm-hmm. Maybe that would be a good time if it was possible, uh, but uh, I, I don't really know what they intend. Sure, sure. I wasn't trying to catch you out there. <laughs> um, before we move on then, just tell us a little bit more about the bullet time shot, um, how that was created and why, just why has that become such a seminal moment in our filmmaking history? And, I, and, it, and it's truly inspirational for machinima creators, I think. But just tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, I think everybody um, on this uh, listening probably would agree with the general statement that you put everything, you put all of yourself into everything you do. You don't do anything thinking it's going to be, you know, um, you know, award worthy, for example, or, or noteworthy, you just do what you do. Right. And when we made that shot, there were multiple shots and they fit inside of a particular, uh, you know, sort of philosophy we had during the matrix trilogy, which was we wanted to do more than, you know, create a visual trick. We wanted to, We wanted to attempt to, you know, create some methods that might be um, the types of methods one might deploy if one was making virtual reality, actually. (laughs) So when we made the bullet time shot and then the, uh, that was like a word jumble. And then uh, (laughs) when we made the, made the, uh, made the, uh, the bullet time shots in the matrix. And then we did uh, more bullet time scenes in the next two films. We really started thinking about how one would capture reality such that you could essentially, you know, uh, have uh, something that would be termed these days, computational photography, photography that was transformable into three dimensional and the reason why you would need that is because only, only in a in a, a simulation would you be able to cheat time and space. You'd be able to, you know, manipulate time. You could be in as many places at once concurrently if you wanted to. You could have multiple views of things. You could do all these sorts of things that defy physics that you know you you know you could never do in the real world. So, I think that it wasn't just you know, the method, it wasn't just the visual. I mean, it read in the concept came across in the visuals of it, right? It was, you knew that you could not move that fast, Mm -hmm. even though it was slow motion, you could never get around objects like that unless you were in some form of virtual reality or simulation. And the reason why it resonated is because the whole narrative and the underpinning you know, concepts of the matrix itself were preceding the moment, (laughs) right? You were all being led, right, to this mind over matter, you know, mind over matrix moment. And, uh, and, And people hadn't 
thought about that as I mean, some people have like Philip K. Dick thought about that all the yeah. time, but the average person didn't really think about that. And so it hit the mainstream in the right way at the right time. You know, the dawn of the real mainstream internet age, you know, um, the rise of gaming and, you know, things like this were going on. And so the audience was kind of softened up enough by that to be able to comprehend it. And so it, and it lasted, uh, but it really was sort of, you know, obviously carried on the, the underlying premise of the matrix itself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's, you know, it's the sort of thing that's exemplified in, in the Resurrections version of world as well, because you kind of really play on that theme in that, in the last part of that film, um, you, uh, where the characters are, are kind of. So to go, so now to go to the next step, you know, um, so we put it in, even though we didn't have enough time to do all of what we were thinking, but, um, you know, so we had, this is kind of like actually a part of the Awakens story that I think is most, uh, is really, it's quite interesting insofar as we essentially went back in the time capsule and pulled out data from 20 years ago. And we literally used it, these captures that we had, you know, photographic H HD video, um, scans, all these things, right? And we pulled them out. Uh, and they were literally stored in a salt mine, you know, in Utah somewhere, underground. They were like in an underground storage area. And like, you could just imagine the Warner Brothers assistant, like at, with a, like a, you know, a miner's headlight, <laughs> like searching through boxes and Kim Library with his like photographic memory <laughs> saying it's it's probably going to be in this box and the file names are this that he like literally remember, remembers all the file names. He's like, you got to get this. And so they like rescue this ancient data. Right. And they have to like essentially convert it, you know, and they they bring back, they resurrect this this material and they they use it to remake a, like a modernized version of virtual neo so so what what i what i find really interesting is back then we were like hey you know one day people are going to do this all the time and they're going to you know create uh, virtual versions of themselves and it's going to give them this strange form of immortality you know on the in the we didn't call it the metaverse at the time but like online virtual you know immortality yeah. and this will be a really big thing we talked about it all the time when we were making the matrix and then here we are 20 years later and we essentially resurrect this old data we build a modernized version of neo which is really fantastically made and now here exists this new Neo, <laughs> right? That they, there is a Neo now that could be, you know, deployed in a simulation or driven by Keanu, right? In a world. So Keanu has, you know, he's one of the people who has, you know, a nice, you know, a nice uh, meta clone of himself. Um, so anyway, we use this to reproduce the shot, but really at this time around, rather even though even in awakens again it was it was part of a a 2d shot version of before you got into the playable but it, it that uh, material exists it's possible for us to actually go in and walk around this bullet time shot we could do it in vr um and and more right so we're getting closer to actualizing um that stuff and it was built upon this ancient stuff, and now it's going to keep going. Um, one one thing, just to keep it back to storytelling. Uh, I mean, one thing that I really would like to do, and I don't know if it's going to get done because it's it's up to Warner Brothers, which is really a difficult, you know, uh, path because it's a lot of people who have to make decisions based on economics rather than passion. But like the the passion request that I had was maybe we need to continue the matrix in world, you know, not just on film and 2d. Mm -hmm. And, 
it could I could easily imagine immersive stories that can still be the actors driving themselves, um, but immersive stories that you know can have uh, branches into free exploration of the world and participation and and all of these things. So here's an example of where really the the vast potential of of you know machinima or virtual cinema intersecting virtual worlds and and open worlds right it's a perfect combination you can f consider the consider the story path like a beautiful sculpture you know that's sitting inside of a dynamic open world you could have many many of these sculptures threads crisscrossing right mm -hmm. on and on and uh you could you know, you could choose to enable the sculpture and sort of follow along and sort of see it, experience it. You know, you could do it if you wanted to do it through a, a composition form. <laughs> you can, you know, you could do cinematography. You could, you could take the composition form out and you could watch it dimensionally as you choose. And you know, so sort of, let's say, you know, jumping around, you could do that in an XR sort of way. And you can just decide to go out the side door and leave the sculpture and just enter the world and start doing things there, uh, meeting people, having experiences inside of that world. And that is definitely, we're like on the precipice of that. I, you know, there's little flirtations of experiments like that, but uh, this is what will turn out to be an incredible dividend of people working with game engines to tell stories is they'll actually just be able to have multimodal to they'll be able to create multimodal experiences mm -hmm. uh, so I, I i don't think it's it's not it's it's you know there have been groups that have experimented with that here and there like telltale and mm -hmm. what have you and like you you do see cool experiments here and there where games interactives hand off like a little bit like we did with with awakens but there's there's definitely a lot that can be done um, in the new grammar of this. Yeah, and I guess one of the one of the areas, because we're now getting to the point when we've got pretty robust uh, movement, gesture, and emotion tracking kit, and that I suppose coupled with things like AI and predictive analytics, which might fill in the gaps. I mean, I, I guess you're now talking about um, how these things can become what, what would you call them NPCs social entertainment uh, yeah. experience that you know that kind of thing so, so they become like you know live characters depending on your interaction with them in whatever platform that you're on i suppose yeah it's a super interesting area uh, i t i totally agree and i'm experiment I'm, i am doing some experiments there myself uh yeah i mean you can't expect i mean like it's going to take a while for the behavior uh, of, you know, how people engage with virtual worlds to really, you know, mature, you know, you know, right now it's all sort of new and people aren't sure and people, it's not what they're used to doing. So it's, it's not to be expected that you're, you're going to have worlds that are filled with actual humans driving their avatars. There's going to be, the early adopters <laughs> will yeah. co, you know, they'll be enthusiasts and early adopters, but a world really needs to be like filled with characters and, and events and things. So there's no doubt that training NPCs to understand world logic, believe they're in the world, um, you know, not just be a uh, tourist like narration machine, like tourist machines. They, they need to be able to, you know, sustain uh, a place in the world's, uh, you know, makeup, um, a, a role. And, uh, and so I could easily imagine large populations of AI guided NPCs uh, that, that help you uh, get a lot of depth and exposition if you're wandering off path. Uh, that's definitely coming mm -hmm. it's not i haven't seen it a lot yet i've seen it i've only you know there's a lot of there's experiments mm -hmm. it's it's getting 
to a point where it's getting uh, fairly clean. Like you can, you know, you can, for example, happen upon uh, some article on the internet written completely by a bot and you might not know it. You know, it's getting, it's getting fairly sophisticated. I was thinking like Red Dead Redemption, you know, the characters in that, they're kind of um, pretty sophisticated NPCs, I think. Um, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And they're well considered, well thought out. Yes. It, that's the whole bit is like how, I mean, it really opens up a huge new area for a form of hybrid writing. It's sort of like writing plus, um, you know, uh, training, <laughs> right, uh, from other materials. So you could have like, you could have a character that has a role in some, let's say it's like uh, some uh, uh, game about uh, the French Revolution. And, you know, you could have a, a bot that, you know, has a particular purpose within some, some narrow uh, uh, moment in the game, but also have a complete, a comprehensive understanding of the French Revolution as well, <laughs> right? And all of the things that went on in those times. And so, you can kind of toggle between very specific narrative um, and more general uh, discussion about the times that you know, that whole experience is set in. So I do I do think that there's like incredible like sort of strategies that you know one could try, where it's sort of like a hybrid of, uh, of of traditional and and now kind of more you know AI based um, generative stuff. Yeah. Just changing tack a little bit. Um, how has the development of machinima, from from your understanding of it, and real time techniques, which I think you're probably far more familiar with, influenced your you and your work over the years? Well, I th- um, let's put it this way. I mean, the same attraction that I think uh, folks who um, are you know working in being independent inside of machinima, I've, I've had that same attraction to that way of working and the potential of working like that for my whole career. And I, I would say I'd like, I, I kind of crossed over, <laughs> like I crossed over around 2010 ish, you know, when I realized that like, I don't really want to work any longer um, in a medium or I don't want to spend the majority of my time in a medium that has an end, you know, at the end of the story, right? I want the world to actually continue to persist and tell many, many more stories inside the same world, have them accrue. um, And uh, as we talked about before, be able to experience the world once I've understood what matters by way of a story. The story gets you the emotional bit. It, it, It tells you like what matters in the world. It could potentially give you you know, your own reason to be in the world. And you can't really do that in cinema. In cinema, you know, it's a storyteller's mastercraft. And and machinima can be that way too, except for once the movie is over, the world is, that's it. <laughs> the world has stopped, right? You may have to jump to a whole nother, a whole different medium, like a gaming version of that world. And I'm not sure I like the having to do the jump, I kind of would like it all to be in one place. And uh, that's what I started realizing. So, you know, the answer to your question, I think, is that since literally since the beginning of people coining the term, talking about it to today, I've like slowly sort of migrated my way over into the realm of it, except I'm trying to I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to get all these other elements as well at the same time, which is, you know, the, the Awakens project to, to some degree shows you little slivers of the elements we care about, I care about. Absolutely. And I think that does come through. But, you know, I tend to think to your point there, really, we're not talking so much about a metaverse, but a multiverse. Um, mm, yeah, I, I heard. Well, um, well, there's a debate on the term, right? The metaverse 
can be the multi they, it can be one in the same mm-hmm. right it's it's all i think it's uh it's kind of open to interpretation i mean you you don't have to i don't believe you have to say metaverses right i think the metaverse is the multi i think they're sure. one in the same they could yeah, be yeah, infinite yeah. worlds inside yeah. well my, my, really where i was going is that you take you take your preferred world with you your you know your your immersive experience with you across all these different platforms um, and and you know then you know depending on your mood and your um, preferences and whatnot you can sort of live in that world across all these different platforms it, and it could be multiple different uh, yeah experiences I guess well you could you could be in multiple worlds at once digital skins you could you could change your digital skins is kind of where I go I'm going with that I suppose uh, you can you can change your skin you could have the same skin um you know you there's i think um this is kind of like it gets a little meta too but like you don't always have to imagine yourself being in a world um whereby it's actually you in a live human sense so for example if let's say that i you know, spend a lot of time in some, you know, virtual world that I like. The whole time that I'm in this virtual world that I like, I could be training an AI clone of myself, right? Mm -hmm. Such that I can leave that world, you know, and enjoy my real world life, which is arguably better, (laughs) much better. You know, it's fun. I, I don't want to be like, deny the fact that reality is pretty great if you make it. Uh, so, but um, but I could leave my virtual self behind to continue to participate in that story world or that other, you know, that, that world, right? Like, I think it would be very interesting if I left my virtual me in a story world and then I would basically get like updates like your virtual your virtual you uh, has wandered, you know, to uh, this region and has decided to join, you know, this group of people and, you know, got in a fight in a bar and built a farm. And, you know, like it just like getting this, this, oh, I decided I did that. Okay. You know, but it would be based, it would be, it would be based on the way you behave, you know, I think that's getting a bit wild. It would be fun if it was a good story world. It's well, coming. it would have to be, wouldn't it? It have to be to, com- to be compelling, I suppose, for you want to, to want to do it. Um, I got, I suppose, another observation. Really, I mean, Kit to me seems to me the the biggest barrier to um, immersive, real time kind of mixed reality experiences, and and that's not just the the cost of it, but the learning curve associated with you know understanding controllers, you know, access, getting hold of it, like PlayStation Five is like hen's teeth at the moment. Um, you know, and then other things like battery life and light field and so on. What's your view of things like Disney's, I don't know what you call it, a holodeck like pattern application that they announced a couple of weeks ago? Is that the future? Is 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 it scalable or portable? Um, or what they, I believe what you're, ta- I think what you're talking about is their um, AR without glasses metaverse That's like it, yeah. announcement. Okay, well that the, just to. Okay, and it, I, what I believe that probably is, is, you know, the Imagineers have uh, for many years been really, I mean, like when I say many, I mean, like since like 50s or whatever, in the 60s, have been masters of using projection technology to create illusions. And they, they do this mixed media thing that's ex- fantastic if you go to the parks where often you, it's like projection mapping in a sense, right? Before projection mapping was a thing in the outside world, they were doing projection mapping. So they're quite good at it and they quite, and they do understand how to create all sorts of depth illusion, but not just that they, you know, they put characters into little vignettes and, and they, uh, and all of this stuff. And what I believe that infers is that, you know, they know that, people having glasses and goggles can be a barrier. It can be friction until, until you can have them, you know, be on, you know, a hundred thousand guests, <laughs> you know, and not break and function and all of, there's a lot of stuff that has to be right to get it to work. 
Uh, they they really uh, have a ver- have a way of doing that in a sort of hybrid reality sort of sense. So they would do really high end projection mapping is the best way I would put it. You know, they could if they if they could they could if they wanted to they could very likely pair it with augmented reality glasses to create you know even more. Uh, but I do think that the way that they're using that term is 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 you know, pseudo holograms, if you will, that are achieved with a fancy projection. Mm. But what I would imagine also that they would do is they would make these, the content that these pseudo holograms are based on in a particular way, like Unreal or game engines, right? In a particular way that it would be a short leap for them to add glasses to that, right? And like extend it and have the content escape and run wild. So, uh, but I almost forget your, 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 what was your question again? <laughs> well, the question was, do you think it's scalable? But I guess the only way you're, you're saying that it might be scalable is uh, if, they, think, if they ma- mix and match it with glasses and whatnot. There's okay. There's a few things that I think that are scalable. I do. I think that there is a way for them, any, not just them, but any of us. Uh, and okay. This is not going to answer your, how do you get tools in the hands of everyone question? This is, this is what is plausible question uh, answer. Uh, it's plausible to create a, an exquisite, flawless replica, dynamic digital twin of a place like Disney World. It's possible to imagine uh, that world being available on screens of all kind through like, you know, big cloud streaming uh, type of uh, solutions. And it's possible to imagine that it's not just like a model Without people, it's possible to imagine the people being represented by way of sensing people in the park and intertwining it with other media. There's a lot of things that I think are possible now where it's a, it's 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 conceivable to have a virtual Disney world that actually is a real-time mirror of what's going on at the moment. And uh, literally down to the potential of, you know, finding one person in the park and ta- and talking to them in a sort of co-presence, XR co-presence sort of way. Mm-hmm. So those, th- I do think that the tools are all there. If there is um, a business case for them that they think that it would, um, you know, lead to big audiences, which I think could actually lead to like having millions more people in the park in a virtual sense, in a co-presence mm-hmm. sense. As far as like uh, democratizing uh, tools and making it possible, I think the combination of a few things are going to kind of come into into effect across the next five years. And that would be, well, I mean, I just saw a story that you can now put Unreal in the cloud. You can just basically have a license in the cloud and you can you could work remotely, uh, which is already already quite interesting. Mm -hmm. But um I also am watching closely trends like, um, you know, AI, you know, a, a natural language process like GPT-3 or maybe the next GPT-3, GPT, mm-hmm. GTP-4, mm-hmm. Um, enabled uh, super intuitive, uh, um, how would I put it, uh, UI for creation, right? So like, build me a castle, boink, you know, yeah. put in, you know, I want horses, right? Uh, let's That's have, Canvas now, um, though, isn't you know, it? What's that? That's Canvas now. We, I think we reviewed that. Canvas is, Canvas is a part of it. It's a two. It's two dimensional, but looks three dimensional. It's part of it, but we will be. We will get to three dimensional. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Prometheus AI. I don't know if it's. I don't know how much of that is truly workable right now, but it seems very interesting. Um, mm-hmm. There's other things, but. I think that's the overwhelming direction that uh, what what where it needs to go simply is that uh, I want to tell a story or I want to create a world or I want to create an experience and I just say it and it's so. <laughs> so that's what everyone needs to work towards. <laughs> Do you know, I'm going to um, read something to you because I was fascinated by your comments when you when you um, did that uh, piece for Paul Marino's book. Um, back in 2004 I don't know if you remember this but you gave an analogy of what you said was the current status of life as being caught in the cross dissolve from a mammoth bone to a spaceship 
in 2001 Space Odyssey. And you said then that we were roughly 12 and a half frames into the Kubrickian 16 frame evolutionary <laughs> process. <laughs> with, with the last few frames, you said, being supported by machines and that those almost thinking machines were not quite life forms. So my question is, where do you think we are now in that cross dissolve? Yeah, that's a good. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> I didn't know uh, what the metric was. Yeah. Okay. So if we're going to use six, six, how many frames did I say? Sixteen, 16 was the total yeah, cross. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I said we were at twelve in two thousand four. Okay. Well, at that pace, <laughs> we're probably at. Golly, I've only got four frames. Um, <laughs> Well, you can add to I'd them, say I we're suppose. probably two. We're probably two to three frames da- further. Wow, we're close. We're close, but not quite there. That's the. That's the. That's kind uh, of- it's coming together. I mean, like it depends. Let's see, how many years since two thousand four to now? Uh, you know, it's like eighteen years, or was that right? Um, so, I would say if. Um, 18 years equals two, three frames that we need approximately, yeah, another, yeah, it's, I, think, I think the math works. I mean, like, I think it's inside this decade for sure that we're going to be at a place where, I mean, I think it's coming in the next few years. The question is, is it going to be, um, you know, put in a form factor that is, you know, um, commercialized so that we can all Mm -hmm. use this stuff. So I would say it's going to be across the next half decade that we uh, get to these, you know, almost invisible, super powered tools, you know, to create worlds and tell stories. And Mm -hmm. and I was going to ask in in real time. Well, to that point, really, what's your take on NVIDIA's Omniverse? Platform. Yeah, I think it's that's definitely a, going to be very significant contributor to this. What we're talking about, mm-hmm. I I think that's really what's interesting about it is um, the way they're approaching it is they are finding a you know a, a common uh, way of tying together different spokes, you know, uh, for example, they're, they're tying simulation, real-time graphics, they're tying AI, you know, digital twins, all of these things together um, in a way that you can, you know, have those uh, pieces interchange, you know, um, their, their advocacy of uh, uh, universal scene description, you know, that the fact that they made a decision, which is everyone else is debating and they, they seem to have made a, de- a decision on how to mm-hmm. allow uh, all of the pieces to relate. Uh, that's only one way of things being able to relate to one another. There's also the world of smart contracts um, mm-hmm. and all of that, uh, that whole end of things. Uh that are going to come into play. But I, I think that the uh, capacity to create flawless simulation <laughs> that, you know, uh, AI sort of uh, is uh, heavily under the hood uh, enabling is, is, is something that Omniverse is uniquely positioned to help us do. So I'm, I'm very excited by it. And I um, have a number of colleagues experimenting with it. Um, I can't say that I've created a project yet in Omniverse, but it's absolutely a goal, a near term, a near term goal of mine. Again, changing the subject and getting to the end here. Um, you posted something I found really fascinating a couple of weeks ago, which may or may not be related to that, but um, it was about creating interactive three D content and putting it on the market. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your thoughts on the role of NFTs and WebEx experiences generally and, and how might that influence or help machinima and real-time creators? 
Well, I think everyone's trying to understand it at the same time. The, the need, the need for a, a premise whereby a digital, um, you know, object or item or uh, any kind of digital media, you know, had some ability of, uh, being unique and singular has always had been the barrier uh, for digital art being taken seriously and digital artists, not just digital artists, but like all kinds of artists, right? Uh, being able to, uh, you know, have a piece of media that can uh, have value um, and uh, accrue and retain value like physical things can. The question is, you know, uh, because be before that time, a piece of digital art or media could be copied infinite. It's they can't, you know, these things could be copied infinitely, but there, and so people never thought there would be a way to create value in one of those copies. But this this system um, has opened the doors to that, and it's been talked about for quite some time. The the uh, the need for this, unfortunately, you know, it's a wash with. Uh, you know, early um, provocateurs, you know, trying to make a lot of money selling a dream of uh, value that may or may not really exist. The dream that I think is being sold is that if you buy this digital item, then this will accrue uh, as we move towards really the underlying the underlying message is as we move towards a a, a digital life a, a life in the metaverse these you know ownership of these things just like ownership of things in the real world will you know you know will be uh, uh valuable and and uh, for you in the future so the thing is though is that those who the means that people draw attention to which digital things have value and which don't is really questionable. It's a very uh, hype based and a lot of manipulation mm -hmm. of perceptions of what matters and what doesn't. It's like, this is important because, you know, it's the beginning of the metaverse and you can have a piece of that. So I'm, uh, there's a lot of people who really are in the business of trying to create very, very valuable <laughs> experiences and, and virtual content that look at this, you know, with some degrees, degree of shock and disgust, because it really is, a, you know, it's, a, it's a manipulation of people, you know, so, you know, in order to, in order to inflate the value of currency, actually, not the, the, the objects themselves. So, um, so, but does that mean it's bad? It's us. It's not actually. It, it, it's like that. Eventually, will like anything. A lot of that hype is going to burn away, um, and people will start uh, being able to determine what might have value and might, what might not. So, the, to me, it's the that is the essential question for everybody. Is like what has intrinsic value. And it could be, you know, different for each person. You know, what it may be like, you know, if you created something yourself, uh, then immediately you have an attachment to it, an emotional attachment to it. And like, and that wouldn't be any different than an artist in the real world doing that. Mm -hmm. Some people might find your creation genuinely compelling. Your, your creation could be, there's, you know, infinite form factors. Uh, so, we need to have a much more serious conversation about what has intrinsic value. Now, I think that go now sort of circling back to your, 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 uh, your question. I think that, uh, there could be, um, a lot of, um, incredible, uh, experiences to be had on remarkable works in machinima and, uh, and I think that um, the um, the question is, you know, um, will others, you know, that are 
in a peer group that we care about, um, if they if they agree that there is um, value there, uh, then then there is a future for machinima and NFT just like any other art form in NFT. Mm. I I think that it's really m- more about you know what what's going on under the hood. Uh, it can be like spiritual, it could be technological, it could be like a, a philosophy of design, it could be, you know, you know, it's, it's like anything else, it's innovation. So why is a Picasso worth what it's worth, you know? You know, what was Picasso doing at the time that was different than everybody else? He starts a movement in a direction, right? And, you know, paintings are interesting uh, just as a, to, to relate to because you know, they, they, uh, you know, some are literal and some are more metaphor, some are conceptual and the concept, if you understand the concept, that's, that's where you might believe the value lies is, oh, that's a, a remarkable concept and it floats to the top, you know, um, in terms of, you know, being viewed as valuable. So that's the way I think things have to be viewed. Mm. I was wondering if you, if, you know, from your view of it, whether you thought there needed to be some sort of intervention which might make it a more democratic environment for creators rather than let the market sort it out because markets just fail. Yeah, I think these particular, these markets at the moment are highly manipulated. Mm. Um, They really are. And I think that they will get sorted out at some point, they'll either be sorted out through regulation or they'll be sorted out by um, the by the consumers of of these things who will who can vote <laughs> with their pocketbooks, with their wallets. Right. Um, but what what the, the real uh, the real um, sort of distortion on 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 things is tends to be how social media and influencers, you know, sort of, you yeah. know, cause uh, confusion about what matters and what doesn't. And that's really the main issue to to work out is who should you listen to? It's 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 nice to have you know some item registered on a blockchain so we know it exists, but it's a little bit different to know if you know these ten you know, groups or people that I believe in and trust their points of view because they have a whole lifetime of uh, sort of correct <laughs> points of view or like points of view yeah. I agree with. Absolutely. If I if I look to these these 10, these, these 10 you know, people and um, they know what they're talking about, then I'm like, okay, I there's probably value there, right? Because there's consensus in some way. But I don't really want to be only looking at um, irrational market behavior around a piece of art, you know, without the consensus of humans, <laughs> right? Also in the mix, you know, humans that know something about art or appreciate it at the very least. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, with all the kit and software developments coming down the line and with um, I suppose the attitude of many of the software developers taking a much more open approach to supporting creators. I think it's it's never there's never really been a better time to be a, a real time creator and, and content fan. Question is, what advice can you give the indie machinima and real time creators today? What what big bit of advice have you got for them? I heard the question. Sorry, <laughs> just checking the calendar. Um, what advice? Um, Well, I'll give one answer that may seem obvious and maybe one that's less. The obvious one is to really uh, don't try to make what you think is wanted by a market or an audience make what you are passionate you know, buy. And it, it just, it sounds, it's, it sounds really, you know, what it, it may sound simplistic, but passion, uh, passion is the, one of the most important aspects of your work. 
Like you really need to believe that you need to, you want to tell something or you want to express something or, or, you know, create something um, that is, you know, a reflection of uh, the way you feel and the way you think and to not uh, allow, you know, overthinking on commercial, you know, uh, opportunity uh, to interfere with that. I would say that because the, the folks, you know, you can break through just trying to make something that's com commercially desirable, but the folks that really, I feel like personally uh, have a, a rewarding experience in a career are ones that stick at least intertwine their passion <laughs> as much as possible. And it's easy enough to say, I mean, it's hard enough. It's hard to always get to work on stuff you're passionate about, but at least work on something at some point that you're actually passionate about. Perhaps you have a balance, right? You got to pay the rent. So you have to do a balance, but don't have an imbalance towards it's only strictly, you know, what you think other people are asking for. So that's one thing as far as the, um, you know, the other bit, one thing I find fascinating is that things are moving so fast in these uh, tool sets that I feel like the trend is overwhelmingly in the direction favoring independent artists in now and across the next couple few years. I really think this is an excellent time. You can um, teach yourself in so many different ways now. Like literally you could learn through YouTube and a lot of things, but um, there's a lot of ways you can, edu you can educate yourself. And if you feel intimidated by technology, you know, and having to learn, um, you know, uh, a lot of methodology that could be uh, complex, there's also new things coming whereby you you don't really need to be a master of tools. You just need to be a master of, you know, what you imagine you want to come out on the other side. The, I think that the, uh, the tool sets are um, overwhelmingly moving in the direction of um, intuitive and uh, some th things that creatives can use, right? So you can, you can, if you're a creative, uh, it's, I think we're heading into a time where um, it's going to be plausible to make something of some sort, you know, with very little, you know, um, detailed knowledge. Now, you may not be able to get to something really sophisticated without help from friends and colleagues who do master tools, but it doesn't mean that you can't get in the game very quickly. You can get in the game very quickly now, and you should, because at the end of the day, what matters is what you're saying, you know, uh, what you're saying matters more than, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the grandeur of the, of the graphics. Uh, so I would, I would, I would be encouraged if I, I was a new, um, you know, um, real time artist, mm. uh, for the, these years now. That's great advice. Thank you. Got to ask this final question. Are you a red or a blue pill person? Oh, you're asking that. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you've been asked it before. Yeah, I know. But like in our culture, everyone's trying to hijack the colors. Oh, and I, so you're I don't, purple then. I, <laughs> I'm going to say I'm full spectrum. I'll, I'll go with every shade of color. Depends on the mood. Fair enough. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I have no more questions, John. It's been an absolute delight to have you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I'm sure our listeners will be absolutely fascinated in the in the observations and comments that you, you've made. Um, thank you so much and um, bye for now. Yeah, nice to see everybody. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>